All righty, good morning. It's good to see everyone here today for another time period of studying through the book of Revelation. Before we begin with our study today, I'm going to ask Dan if he would direct our minds in that word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before thee at this time in the most humble manner that we know how. Aware of the creation that you have made for us and, and we're awed in your presence and we pray Heavenly Father that you'll be with us and help us to as we study uh, thy concepts and this uh, revelation to John from Jesus we pray that you'll be with us and help us to understand uh, everything that we need to know about it to apply uh, your concepts and statutes to our daily lives and we pray that You'll be with those of our number who are unable to be with us uh, due to illness. And uh, those that are bereaved, we ask you to be with them, strengthen them in their faith. And we pray that you'll use us, Heavenly Father, as your tools to reach out to this nation around us and carry your word to them. And we'd ask the Heavenly Father to be merciful unto us. And as we for repent of our sins, we ask for thy forgiveness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> okay. Make one correction. People watching at home are seeing something interesting going on up here. Beth said she got it now. Oh, it's working now? Good, okay. Just the wrong day. It was. <laughs> oh, the wrong day? <laughs> I'll fix that. Oh. <laughs> there we go. I had this all set up beforehand, but when I restarted it, the corrections I made were lost because I had to just dump the whole program, so... There we go. Now it should look better. For now. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and resume with our study that we began in last, last week. We were looking in Revelation chapter 6. And in our study through Revelation chapter 6, uh, we completed the whole of the study. And then we're going to be doing the questions for Revelation 6 and then step into chapter 7. There is a little bit of a brief review we'll do before we step into 7. It's just a small review. But before we do that, let's go ahead and plan and do the questions now for Revelation chapter 6. Let me get those up here. All right, let's see. One more. Okay, so... Starting there, the question number one of Revelation chapter 6. What did John see when the Lamb opened the first seal? Yeah, yeah. So when they opened the first seal, he said, saw a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow, when he continues there with that description there. All right, now let's look at the next question here. What did John say when the Lamb opened the second seal? What did John see? What did John see when the Lamb opened the second Yep, another horse fiery red went out. Okay. Number three, to whom was it granted to take peace from the earth? The one who sat on that horse. All right, the rider, the one who sat on that horse, back up in verse four there. Okay. Number four, what did John see when the Lamb opened the third seal? Yeah, he saw there the black horse, okay? Let's see, um, number five. Who was given power over a fourth of the earth? Yes, he sat on the pale horse. Yep, coming down here to the fourth seal there, he saw the pale horse, and the name of it, who sat on it was Death and Hades, and gave him the power over a fourth of the earth, okay? Number 
chapter 6, what did John see when the Lamb opened the fourth seal? The pale horse. Sorry. We did, didn't we? Oh, thank you. Number 7, what did John see when the Lamb opened the fifth seal? Yeah, and kind of notice specifically here, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. So showing them in the presence there of the Lord. Number eight, what happened when the Lamb opened the sixth seal? Earthquake, black sun, and stars fell. Yeah, there in verse 12 there. And that kind of brings us up then to our review a little bit here before we go into chapter 17. One of the things, or chapter 7, when we were looking at this last week and talking, this really looks like ultimately the final judgment scene. As far as when you, when you think about the, um, the, the full destruction that is painted here in 13 and 14, the kings of the earth, the rich man, and the great men and the rich man and others seeking uh, a place to hide within the caves and the rocks of the mountains. And then notice there in verse 16, um, said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So this kind of paints the picture as the day of vengeance we talked about last week, the day of retribution or divine retribution upon those who were disobedient to God and more upon those who had been the persecutors of his people. All right, any thoughts or comments about that? I was thinking it would be futile to try to find a place to hide because it says that the earth is going to be rolled up like a scroll. Yes. There should be nothing, nothing remaining out. So what's it, it's futile to run from. Exactly. Yeah, nowhere to hide. Yes, uh, Travis. There's some, um, I, I remember reading some similar language that Jesus said in Luke 23. Um, he was on his way to the crucifixion. And in verse like 28 is kind of where it starts it. But um, he, sa he, he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. It's a very good point. Did, did your Bible have a footnote as to where that's quoted from? No. Okay. Uh, I, I remember reading that before about mountains and rocks falling on us and, and covering us, him kind of prophesying about the destruction there. Well, no, what we're looking at, well, I was wondering if it had a footnote to an Old Testament uh, passage there that it might have been um, pulling from. But, the, but you're right, though, the, the imagery there is the same. It basically, there's no hope, there's nowhere to hide, collapse on us, hide us that way, but it would kill us as well. Uh, there's a cross reference in chapter 9 and verse 6 says the same thing okay chapter 9 verse 6 of Luke no revelation of revelation sorry. Okay. Sorry. yeah all right any uh, any other thoughts okay let's see and then the last thing to note here in verse 17 we'll come down there real quick is he says for for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand now in a minute, we're about to step into chapter 7. And we step into chapter 7, we're going to see two different stages, if you would, in chapter 7, uh, depending on how, of course, one explains the book of Revelation. The first half of it, which goes down from verse 1 through 8, is going to be the picture, uh, a picture that represents the faithful on earth. The faithful on earth. And then when we get to um, <coughs> verses 9 through the end of the chapter, we're going to be looking at all of the faithful. And more importantly, all the faithful before the throne. I'll just write before up there and leave it at that. Uh, but before the throne of God. And so two different sections here. And this is important to understand, especially when we look at the first eight verses or first seven verses of this, because it has often been misused by religious leaders within the world. And one religious group we'll talk about very specifically um, has a heyday with the 144,000 number. And the problem is their interpretation of the text contradicts 
everything else that we see and we'll kind of elaborate a little bit on that. Um, any thoughts or comments though before we continue? Uh, John, going, yes. Going back to the mountains falling. <coughs> yes. Um, Hosea 10, um, there you go, 10, 8. Hosea 10, chapter 8. Also no, the, chapter 10, verse 8. Verse 8. Also the high places of Ven, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed, the thorn and thistles shall grow on the altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. So that is either when Jesus is teaching there is a direct quote or it's a common phrase that we see both within the, the, the writings of Hosea and then the words of Jesus. And similarly in Revelation chapter 6. Appreciate that. Appreciate that, Aaron. 7, 9, Zephaniah. Uh -huh. <coughs> the great day of the Lord is near, it is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. Matching the, the, the distress that's seen within there. All right, very good, very good. All right, let's step up now, let's step over. Let's turn to... He's not here today, so I can say whatever I want to say. <laughs> but <laughs> let's go to Revelation chapter 7. <laughs> and I think I'm not surprised by that. When I first started preaching, my first full time work was in a small little town called Off, Alabama. And there was this preacher that had retired there. He had preached there before me and retired there. He had been preaching some 50 some odd years, 53 years. <laughs> Um, and one of the things he said to me, I would say, turn over in your Bibles too. He says, you can't say turn over in your Bibles too. You can say turn to Luke 7 verse 1. But you don't say turn over to. Oh, I thought that was interesting. Right up there with you don't raise kids, you rear kids. And you use the rear kids to raise kids sometimes. So. All right. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like a child, don't you? What's that? Feel like a child? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's start reading now in Revelation chapter, chapter 8 and 7. Follow the chart. And um, let's read the first three verses first. And Maxine, would you mind reading those for us? After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. So we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. All right, let's pause there for <coughs> just a moment. And I'm going to make one minor change up here for just a second. And then we'll continue. Let's see. Let's see if we can make this a little bit, <coughs> a little bit better there. All right, let me focus on it a little bit more. I'm almost one verse at a time on here, which works well. So what does he see here standing at the four corners of the earth? Yeah, he sees four angels there standing at the four corners of the earth. What are they holding? Yeah, they're holding the winds of the earth, specifically that the wind should not blow on earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Now, the significance of this is when you look at different Bible passages, there are times in the past where God has used wind to represent his force and his destructive power. We're going to look at two verses here. The first one is in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 36. Let's see, Jeremiah chapter 39. What did I do wrong? 49, verse 36. There we go. And notice there with me here, he says, Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four corners of heaven, and scattered them towards all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcast of, e of Elam will not go. Now see the imagery there. Bring the four winds from the four corners of heaven and scatter them towards all these winds. Another example is in the same book of Jeremiah, this time chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. 
He says, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in Lev Kami, a destroying wind. And I will send winnowers to Babylon, who shall winnow her and empty her land. For in the day of doom they shall be against her all around. What does it mean to winnow something? Isn't it put in the stack? Winnow? No. It's not, it. not stacking it up. It's 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 Blowing it. Cleaning. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a beating of it. All right. Winnowing. All right. Let's look up the word here before I go because you just all made me doubt myself here. <laughs> um, let's see. I want to. I want to double check this before I, I say what I think it is. That way, if I'm wrong, I can pretend like I'm right. Um, shall fans what the English stand or the new the King James version say? Mm. And uh, what it's going to be, let me bring that up there, get the right one. There we go. All right, so we'll pop that up here for a second. Um, to diffuse, when it'll cast away, compass, disperse, fan, scatter away. All right, think about, you've heard about them, um, whenever they would go and separate the, the grain from the holes, the chaff, all right. The, the winnowing part was how they got rid of the chaff part, okay? They would throw it up, okay, and the chaff would separate from the wheat, and part of the idea of a winnowing fan was the fan there or the wind to disperse the chaff and separate it from the wheat. And so when you look here at this particular case of point in Jeremiah, and I only bring this up because just so the explanation here, he says, I will send winnowers to Babylon who shall winnow her and empty her land. In other words, not so much separating the chaff from the wheat, but the idea of the wind being used to scatter them and to separate them. Yeah. All right, any thoughts? So it's more than likely then when he, when he references the four angels and the wind from the four corners of the earth here, telling him that it not, should not yet blow on the earth, we're talking about something that is very destructive. Okay. But the most important part is he's telling them to hold it back, to don't do it just yet. All right, any thoughts before we uh, step into verse 2? All right, notice the, the, the imagery continues here. And so he saw an angel that's ascending from the east having what? <coughs> yeah, notice there it says having the seal, having the seal of the living God. This is extremely crucial to what we're about to see regarding the 144,000. And it says, And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Now notice, what was granted to the four angels to do? To harm the earth and the sea. Okay. Now this is very important because if we were to take the idea that Revelation was prophesying the destruction only of Jerusalem, then this type of destruction would be hard to comprehend. This is a worldwide destruction that he's talking about. Now, with such a worldwide destruction, what comes to mind? The end of time. Exactly. The judgment of God, 2 Peter chapter 3. Destruction of the earth by God. All right, so notice, though, here's what he said to them. He says, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have what? Exactly. Until we have sealed, sealed the servants of the Lord. And that's very, yeah, very crucial to understanding what we're looking at here. Um, it looks like someone in the chat room gave us the Hosea 10 verse 8 as well. I just didn't have that, didn't have it brought up on the screen there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry. So, with this case in point right here, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. So, when we're looking at this, we're looking at those who are on the earth. Because remember, he's going to come destroy the earth. Don't do it yet. Because we've got to seal the, the foreheads, or seal, put the seal of the servants of our God on their forehead. So this would be talking about all those who are living upon the earth. All right, any thoughts? All right, let's continue here now. And if you do have a comment or a question, don't hesitate to raise your hand, I've, even if I've already stepped on. Let's read now beginning in verse 4. And uh, Miss Wilma, read for us, if you would, in Revelation 4, and uh, Revelation 7, and read for us verses 4 and 5, please. <coughs> 
third number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes and of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. All right, and Miss Judy, let's continue with 6, 7, and 8, please. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. And yeah. eight. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. All right, let's pause there for a moment. Now, I've already looked at this ahead of time, so I know the answer to this question. And if you have two, you'll know the answer to the question. And we'll talk about it here in a minute. What two tribes are missing? <laughs> Manasseh and Ephraim. No. But they yeah. Well, Look right here. Yeah. Right. There's Manasseh. There's Manasseh. Okay. But. Ephraim and um, Levi. No. no. Oh. <laughs> I think I misspelled it. All right. Who else is missing? We know. It, it's right. Ephraim is missing. I spell Ephraim real quick. My spell was shut down on me. Ephraim. Not Ephraim. It's not Ephraim. R A I M. It looked like it was missing one. Okay. So, but who else though? Dan. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we have Dan here. Next to me. All right. Dan's missing from this list as well, and we'll talk about possible reasons why. But that's really not the important part. The important part, he says, of each one of these, we see the word, and the 12,000 were what? Sealed. Sealed, exactly, with the seal of the Lord. Now, it is interesting to note in here that how many tribes, although two were missing, Ephraim and Dan, how many tribes are listed here? Twelve, Twelve of them, exactly. Now, um... Why would there be 12 if Dan and Ephraim are missing? Well, it mentions Joseph. It mentions Joseph, and who else? Levites. No. They do, it does mention Levites, but that's not it. Well, Joseph and Manasseh would be kind of redundant. Yeah, but what it is, is remember, Manasseh and Ephraim weren't, weren't, dis, weren't immediate sons of, of Jacob. They were sons of Joseph, okay? Joseph, however, didn't have a, a land, pro, uh, he didn't have a, a tribal land, it was his sons. And Levites did not have a land either. You know, that's where you get the 12 when you figure Manasseh and Ephraim. But if we lose Ephraim and we lose Dan, but we see Levi, we then see Joseph. And that's how we get 12. Now, here's the important thing behind here. How many, he says of the 12 tribes, how many thousands of each tribe were sealed? 12. Okay, so you got 12. But what was the total number of this? 144,000. So essentially, you have 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10, giving 144,000, if you were to break it up that way. Now, we've seen this before in our study through Revelation, that 12 typically in the apocalyptic literature is referring to whom? Well, the 12 tribes, or more importantly, the, co the covenant people of God. Okay, Those who are in covenant relationship with God. And so we see that number twice. Okay, 12 tribes, 12,000 within each tribe. What did we say 10 in the apocalyptic literature kind of references? Typically something complete. Okay, so we have 10 times 10 times 10. I mean, it, it would, it, when you factor the, the figures and everything, this is what it would have to be. Hmm. What's that? 12 times 12 is 144,000. Yeah. yeah. Twelve times twelve is one hundred forty-four thousand. Twelve thousand times twelve thousand is one hundred forty-four thousand. Yeah, but what is twelve times ten? One hundred 
120. And what's 120 times 10? And what's and what's 120 be 1200? What's 1200 times 10? 12,000. 12,000. What's 12,000 times 144? 144,000. <laughs> okay. I'm lost. Okay. Let, all right. Let's do this like this before I, I get letters from the people at home. Because it didn't add up anyway. I was just pretending. All right, so do right here. You've got 144, right? All right, now, so 144 times 10 would be what? Would be 1,400, right? 1,440. One, zero. Okay. Well, that's what I thought, but I, I'm hearing things wrong. All right, so... Now bear in mind, I don't do math normally, so this is hard on me. All right, two zeros. Boy, that should be easy, shouldn't it? So now that's 14,400. Now what happens if you add, uh, multiply that by 10? You get 144,000. Okay. There you go. But it says 12,000, so why didn't we just start with 12,000? I was going to say, it's easy. 12,000 times 12,000. See, when I went to school, they let us figure things out by ourselves. <laughs> but it's 12,000 from each tribe. Now, i got to do long math. Hang on here just a minute. Let's see. 0, 0, 0, 4, 2. 144, and then you add zero. No, i got to do it. Wait, she wants me to do it up here. That's why I was taught that. All right, so there you go, go. 0. You better tell him. Let's see, zero, 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 two, one. So zero, 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 six, three. No, no, no. So what, what you're telling me is 12,000, 12 times is how much? 144,000. But how did you get the 12,000? Because 12,000 each No, I know that. <laughs> but in... 12,000... <laughs> okay, follow me here, because if not, the whole point Robert Harkrider makes in his commentary that I'm pretending to be my point goes out the window. No. Where do you get the 10? Yeah, that's what... Where's the 10 from? What, what, what he does is he... Because we're looking for apocalyptic numbers, Okay. What happens when you take, you take 12,000 and you divide it by 10, okay? In other words, if you, how, how do you get 12 to 12,000? You multiply it by 10, and then take that number, multiply it by 10, take that number, multiply it by 10. That's how you get 12,000. That's what his suggestion is, 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 is the completeness here, all right? You have 12 possibly representing the people of God, and then this 12,000 number right here, is going to be the, 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 the 12 again representing the people of God, but a completeness seen within what it takes to get to this figure. That's, that's kind of the point, and I apologize for not getting to that in a more direct that did help. and less complicated fact. I thought I said it at the beginning, but not that clear, though. So I'll go back and watch the tape the video. Well, it, it, it is, but the idea that, at least from what I have read on it, ten, ten, 10 is the idea of something that is complete, something that is full. 7 is perfection, but 10 would be the idea of something that is complete or full. Numerically complete. Numerically complete. How about that? Does that sound better? Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> all right. Now, someone says, what's the purpose of all this? The purpose is this. What we're looking at here, if we understand this right, is that the 144,000 are all the faithful living on the earth. Okay, um, Not all the faithful of all time. That's the next section that we're going to be looking at here. But it may be that this is representing all living Christians when this was written. Or more, not so much literally every living Christian, but the idea of all the living faithful. Because what was it they were, they were given? They were giving a seal. All right, given a seal, exactly. And the idea of the seal here, and I, I apologize for that numerical confusion there on my part. That's, that's why I, I chose not to be a math teacher. Um, 
whenever we think about um, the seal, does the does the Bible kind of teach that we are we are sealed in a manner of speaking? Yeah, yeah in in the New Testament. Um, <coughs> Look over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. And I, again, I apologize for that confusion there. Um, yeah. You don't have a little bit of confusion when you're studying Revelation. You're doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's basic math. <laughs> My explanation of it. But you, it's a fact that you can do just about anything with numbers. You can prove your point with numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, regardless... If you said, if you took the number away and said all, you wouldn't be doing any harm to the scripture. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, and, you know, this is one explanation of many. It's the most reasonable one that I see, you know, for this. But uh, look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, talking about being sealed here for a moment. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And what we see here within this is the giving of hope. Okay, The idea that those who are still on earth living faithfully before God have the hope that they are sealed with his promise, sealed with the blood of Christ. And, and what is suggested here within this particular text when he talks about the 144,000 would be those upon this earth who were sealed, who were faithful unto God. And when we come down to verse... Um, well, we'll start with verse 9 here in just a moment. It is the idea that he's saying, don't destroy the world yet until you put the seal upon all my faithful. And here they are. And it's not literal descendants of the tribe of Judah, all right, but the, I, the representative of all the faithful of God that lives upon the earth. So someone says, well, well how do I know the Lord won't destroy the earth before, before I am delivered? Well, this is our promise. You know, and no matter what government comes and, and make, tries to annihilate Christianity, we know that that won't bring about the end. You know, that we still have the, 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 the faithfulness and the perseverance of God until that final day. Rhonda? This is it, couldn't we see it too as each of these being descendants of Abraham and the fact that he was promised that his children, his descendants, would be like the stars of heaven, the sands of the shore, you know, innumerable, and that's kind of in a sense what we're saying that, you know, Christians throughout, there's, it's a large, it's not an exact number, it's a large number that God's looking at. I would suggest that's the next section. Okay. When, when we, then that's a great reference to the promise to Abraham, that his descendants, his descendants would be as innumerable as the stars of the heaven. That's starting in verse 9, and we'll see that here in just a moment. Um, this would be more upon, you know, in other words, you think about it, you have two types of followers of God, if you would. One type of follower of God is living on earth. One type of follower of God is waiting to spend eternity with God in heaven. All right. So to those people who are still on the earth at this time period, he had to tell them, you're sealed. Okay, just be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. All right, in a minute, we're going to look at everybody standing before the throne of God, all the faithful, okay? An innumerable amount, yeah. All right, any thoughts or comments? Only God can seal. <laughs> well, that's true, and it's with his promise. He, he sent us the Holy Spirit as, 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 as earnest or as a guarantee of the fulfillment of his promise. Um, it's only him that has the right and the power and the authority to do that, and to protect us. It doesn't mean that we won't perish physically because that's what we looked at in chapter 6. All right, the, the, in the various seals, there would be problems that we would face, but we will be delivered as seen within that sixth seal. All right, any thoughts? Well, it, it still seems to me, he's, he's talking here about the, the tribes of Judah, the Jews. Yes. So the 144,000 Jews. Isn't that right? Well, figuratively, that's what he's referring to. But well, figuratively, well, that's Israel, that Israel that yes. He names the twelve tribes. Yes. Mm -hmm. so there are twelve thousand each one. There's hundred forty-four thousand of the tribes of Judah. So that's that's Jew. Right, and a couple chapters later, he's going to identify them as male, unwedded Jewish men. 
here, here in a couple chapters, he's going to address the 144,000 again and use that figure. But here's, here's something to think about before we move on. I'm glad you said that, Gene, because I nearly, I nearly forgot to, to talk about this. Turn over in your Bibles for a moment, and we'll bring it up here, to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28 for a moment. The idea of referring to the church as being Israel, as being the 12 tribes, is not an uncommon thing. Notice here in um, Matthew 19, 28, So Jesus said to them, As surely I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne in his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Not literal Israel as it was, but spiritual Israel. Uh, let's come down to, or turn over to Luke chapter 22, verse 30 for a moment. Over in Luke chapter 22, verse 30, we read that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then the last one, notice in, and we're going to jump ahead now to Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. Let's see. Here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, notice there that it says, sorry, I'm having difficulty typing, it looks like. There we go. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So when we look at the New Testament, it's not completely foreign to, to the idea that the church is considered a spiritual Israel. And we know from a passage in Romans, I believe it is, that it kind of compares, it says one who is a true Jew, if you would, is one whose circumcision is inward and not outward. So within the scope of that, it would, it would stand a reason that in a figurative way, the Jews that he's referring to there would represent his faithful people. Yeah, yeah. All right, any thoughts? All right, let's see. Let's go, jump back to the text now, and let's begin reading in verse 9. I think that's everything I wanted to look at there. Yeah. Okay, so now we're looking at something different. So, Dan, let's start with you. Um, not really different, but something that we're going to jump forward, so to speak until a little bit later in the scene here. Let's read beginning of verse 9, Dan, and read verses 9 and 10, please. Okay. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, all the nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Good. And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All right. Miss Betty, would you like to read 11 and 12? All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. All right, and then Aaron, let's read verses 13 and 14, please. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. All right, and Jean, let's read verses... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgot to scroll the chart. <laughs> Gene, let's go verses uh, 15 through 17, please. Therefore, they before the throne of God and served him uh, day and night in the temple, and he, and he that sitteth on the throne shall, shall uh, uh, dwell among them. I closed my eyes this morning, I'm sorry. Would this be bigger up here? No, Can, I can't. That's not quite big enough. Okay. I'm having trouble with it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And they shall hunger no more, and neither shall they thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. And the land which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them to the living uh, fountains of waters, and God shall Wipe away all tears from your thank you. All right, let's step back up now to verse <coughs> 19, verse 9. Now, notice we, we see a change here. 
He says, after these things I looked, okay, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. So we're, what we're doing now is kind of stepping into the example that Rhonda brought up a while ago in regards to the promise Abraham and his descendants being in as innumerable as the stars of the heaven. Now we have a great multitude which no one could number. That's good to know because we're tired of math this morning. <laughs> All right. So a multitude which no one could number. And notice what it says of all what? Of nations, of all tribes, peoples, and tongues. Okay. Now, does this sound like we have now jumped forward to potentially the day of judgment? Okay. He sees this great multitude standing where? Before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, clothed in what type of robes? What would have enabled the great multitude to have been able to have been clothed in white robes? Purity, spotless. What did you say, Gene? Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, exactly. With palm branches in their hands. Palm branches were typically used at times, and we saw this with the triumphal infantry entry of Jesus there in Jerusalem as worship, okay, of worship and praise. And so they've got the palm branches in their hands, and these who are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to whom? The Lamb. The Lamb. Does it, this is very similar to what we've seen earlier in Revelation, another song of praise being sang unto God and to the Lamb. In verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne, and who else? We have the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. Now, pause for just a moment here, and let's step back in our Bibles. Let me grab the right passage here. When we began this throne room scene in chapter 4, we saw there the throne of God, the 24 thrones, the 24 elders with their, their crowns clothed in white robes, um, and all the host of heaven. And they were looking to see who would be worthy to take the scroll and to open it. Well, when we hit chapter 5, we see the introduction of that being the Lamb that was slain, the, the Lion of Judah. But still in verse 6 of chapter 5, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood lamb as though been slain. You still see the heavenly hosts, but not all. Okay, we kind of see a little bit difference here. Okay, but now when we come to this, to chapter 7, we have now looked at the faithful on earth. All right, and we've seen what they've gone through with the, with the, with the four not the four, the this, this seal number two, three, four, okay? And then what their prayers are heard by God in the fifth seal. And the sixth seal, God brings about the retribution, the vengeance. Well, in chapter seven, we see, okay, those who are living on earth, they have the seal of God. And interestingly enough, and we'll talk more about this, those who follow the devil, do they have a seal? Exactly. We really didn't talk about that. Yeah. There is a mark of the beast. Now, there are different ideas and thoughts regarding that. But if we look at it in a very simple standpoint, those who serve God are sealed. And those who serve Satan are sealed as well. You know, they have the, they have the sign on them that signifies them. And we have, if you would, the sign on our forehead signifying us. Okay. Gene. Yeah, verse 14 says, And these are they which came out of a great tribulation. Yes, Which yes. Which is against suggestion and a time. Exactly, yeah. Because all of, our, all of our lives as Christians, we will face tribulation. All Christians face tribulation in one form or the other. Some worse, some less. But finally, when that end comes, as Gene says, we'll be delivered, come out of that tribulation. Yeah. Um, but let's look here. Any thoughts so far about this? All right, let's go a little bit farther here with this one now. These that were gathered around the throne, what did they do in verse 11? Yeah, they fell on their faces before the throne. And whom did they worship? They worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and honor, thanksgiving, or I'm sorry, 
blessing, glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor be power and might, be to our God forever and ever. The same song of praise, the praise of our glorious God. All right, then, any thoughts about this? All right, let's continue now. One of the elders came up, and remember there was 24 of them. Okay, 24 of them. One of them came up to John, and they said, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? So remember the scene that we talked about earlier did not have this multitude of white-robed, innumerable people. Now they're there. Okay, now they're there. And so John says to him in verse 14, Sir, you know. So the elder says to him, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, any thoughts or comments about that? Interesting question to think about for a minute. At what point are we washed in the blood of the Lamb? Baptism, Baptism okay. Dan, we need, to, we need to talk to the other elders about getting one of their smart boards they use in school. Because then I can come and actually write on this and it wouldn't mess up the... <laughs> I'm wanting to do that and it won't work. I guess we could angle it down and put it on the board right here. And then I could, that'd be my dumb board, but I could still write on it. Um, anyway, so they washed the... Okay, these individuals had been made white and made them white in the Lamb of the Blood. That takes place, as was said, when we're baptized. All of our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. So, we are delivered. We come out of this great tribulation. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out the best way of really looking at this. There's two ways of looking at this. I still like what Gene said, um, and that is the kind of thought that Brother Harkrider takes, is that the great tribulation is when all Christians finally, the Lord comes again and we're judged by God and we are able to enter into heaven. That puts us into that great scene whereby we're all praising God. But another way, and, and this may just be a matter of the way that it is worded here within the text here, is that it puts the wash their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb after what? After coming out of the Great Tribulation, okay? Mm -hmm. So that would then present a possibility that this Great Tribulation would be referring to one coming out of sin, being made alive in Christ. I'm not so certain about that, and it may just be the simple fact of the way that's laid out here. But I, I do lean to the idea that those who come out of the Great Tribulation would essentially be those who have lived faithfully. Take the 144,000 we looked at who were living on earth with the seal of the Lord on their forehead. Now jump forward to the day of the great judgment. And now they are standing before the throne of God. And they are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. Uh, any thoughts or comments about that? I just have one thought about the 144,000. I think if we take that number literally, we've got to assume that each of the 12 tribes had 12,000 people found justified in it. Well, and that's, that's why you don't take it literally. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is, what we can take from that number is that all of those people who were obedient and uh, every one of those, and the number I think is, uh, like you said a while ago, it's, it's a, an apocalyptic meaning, meaning all, or a comp the yep. complete number of those. So uh, uh, I think it would be, it would be hard pressed to say that each tribe had the exact same amount of Jews that were justified. Exactly, and, yeah. Uh, I don't think we can do that. So if we just say that all of those people from under the Mosaic Law that were justified is going to be there. Mm -hmm. And then all of these, uh, after all of these, all of those under the New Dispensation, mm -hmm. or the, uh, the, the New Covenant, the one, Christ. The new covenant right. the one we're living under now, are going to be there uh, in white robes. Exactly. Going back to the representatives of the, tw of the 12 and 12, of the 24 elders, right. possibly 12 being the 12 tribes, 
and then the second 12 being possibly those taught by the apostles, signifying two different dispensations. Yes, Gene? It, 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 it suggests equality. The same way that, that Paul says the Jews and the Gentiles are equal in God's sight. Mm -hmm. So there's no difference there. And what suggests to me that the end of time is because it says uh, at the end, those who uh, are dead will come back with Christ. While we right. who are alive, who are still on the earth, will be caught up to meet him in the air. So these are the, these are the, this is the multitudes that have survived the great tribulation. Right. And they are called to meet Christ. And it's equal because, as, as I said, as Paul says, um, there's no difference in God's side between Jews and Gentiles. Right. And, and we see the completeness. If you were to take the number 144,000 break it down, you could look at 12. Do we need to do this again? <laughs> but but it is the completeness of the believers on earth and this would be at any generation in other words those who live faithfully on earth they have the seal of the lord and then at this scene right here they'll be before the the great throne of god and that's the significant thing is yeah. if if anybody can seal someone or promise someone anything mm -hmm. Who would be uh, better to do that than Jehovah God? Exactly. And who could break the seal? No one. Exactly. You know, no one can snatch us out of God's hand. As long as we are living, as long as we are in God's hands, exactly. if that well, makes sense, in I his can, fellowship. I can yep. jump out of God's protective yeah. clutches, but no one can snatch me out of there. The That's right. The way I can leave is if I leave on my own. Well, Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Exactly. He's talking about things external to us. Nothing can separate us. From so the no love one of can Christ. break the seal, and, right. the, and the seal is a promise. Right. All right. Any other thoughts? You say later on we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when we hit to it in one of the later okay. chapters. Okay. Yeah. There, that's the contra, that contrary part. Yes. To the, to the seal of God. That's right. That's exactly right. With, when we, here we're looking at those who have the seal of God because they have been found acceptable. And then we're going to have those who have the mark, as it were, of the beast because they're following him. A contrast there between the two of them. Yeah, and the, the six is, the 666 is indicative of incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. All right, I like that, but we'll look at it when we get there. <laughs> No, that's, that's an interesting point. A lot of different theories on that. That's an interesting point. Um, all right, real quick here. We're almost out of time. So there we have, therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple or his sanctuary. And the, when you look at the Greek word translated there, it is one, one suggested translation would actually be they're covered in his sanctuary. Okay, it, it, is, it is there within him. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So this does very clearly look to be the throne room scene at the day of judgment. When we have entered into the heavenly realm, no longer shall there be any more hunger or thirst. Sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say that reminds me of the song. That's right. I think this was written first, though, probably. Uh, now, there is another thought behind this, and I'll just, and I'll mention it briefly, that this is viewed as being actually the church, that those who have come out of tribulation are those who have obeyed the gospel's call, and it is within the church that all this is taking place, where we are serving God and in a, in a spiritual sense, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And so I think author Ogden, or Alex Ogden, and I need to look, no, author Ogden, I need to double check this, would say that this is actually the state of those in the church all right, who have come out of the tribulation of the world and have been washed free by the, or washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, in that sense, this is the church before God every day, properly serving Him. So that's an, another way of looking at that. Gene. Yeah, and it says in verse 16, they shall hunger no more, which reminds me of the, the occasion of Jesus and Samaritan woman when yeah. he said, I have food that you know not of. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. 
And, I, and I, he says, I'm the, yeah, when the apostles came back to him and he says, I've already eaten. Well, he says to her that he's the living water and one would have to partake of him. Yeah. And I think even in Revelation 6, he even says, refers to himself as the bread of life that they would have to partake of. Yeah. Or John 6, not Revelation 6, John 6. All right, any other thoughts or comments? <coughs> Uh, we are right now at the top of our hour, so let's go ahead and plan to do the questions for Revelation chapter 7 next Tuesday morning. And then after we do those questions for Revelation chapter 7, we will then go into chapter 8. Chapter 8. Any thoughts or comments about this? All righty, appreciate all your participation. Oh, yes, Jane. I've got to make one comment. Are any questions you thought sometimes? You could, by, by trying to make all the possibilities understandable, you create more confusion than you do clear air. Yeah. And I, you see some of that uh, when we talk about it. Mm -hmm. We try to figure out exactly what each one of these issues means, which means one thing to one person, one thing to something else, and you're pretty much a confused issue, rather than what the picture says. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Go back to, to whom it is written and what was the message intended. Hello. Exactly. That's the point. That's the point of, of this. And, and, and stay away from trying to uh, assign everything possible in your mind to the numbers or or apocalyptic uh, writings, and just get who was it written to and what was the intent of the, the writing. Exactly. And then you can uh, and then you can draw your your own uh, in conclusion in the matter. That's right. But. I think that a lot of people try to to make it mean uh, events of the day, yeah. and you can't you can't apply that to the events of this day. The, right. It's it's the context that we're focused on, and the overall meaning that we the, well the the hope we see victory and hope here. Yeah. All right, we'll continue this next Tuesday tonight. We'll have the Scriptway broadcast at seven thirty at live. Not Scriptway org. Appreciate all the participation and comments. If you would, let's go to our Heavenly Father in order of prayer. And Gene, would you mind directing our minds in that prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful to thee, as we all should be. For the opportunity we have to come together as our children to study from thy word, be encouraged by it, strengthened by it, and learn from it. We pray that we may look to the scriptures only, rather than to man's thoughts, in determining our beliefs, our promises able to reach that time in our lives when we so confidently hear thee say, welcome thy good and faithful servant. These things we pray in the name of our Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen.